Welcome to this section. Now you will learn object-oriented analysis and design. We will analyze a scenario and identify the classes, attributes, and methods that are required to build an actual tic-tac-toe game. By the end of this section, you will have a working tic-tac-toe game implemented with the principles of object-oriented programming. Are you ready? Let's begin. Before we start working on the actual game, let's see some guidelines that you can apply as you analyze problems with an object-oriented approach. First of all, classes are typically identified in a problem description from the nouns. Attributes are commonly or typically identified with the adjectives, or they could also be nouns in certain scenarios. And methods are typically extracted from the problem description as verbs. Whenever you see verbs that apply to a specific class, then that is a potential candidate for a method. Classes are usually nouns, for example, animal, person, truck, address, account, car, client, date, and task. As you can see, these are all nouns, and depending on the context of the problem, they could be potential classes. You just need to identify them in the description. Then, right here we have attributes. They are commonly extracted as adjectives. Some of them could also be nouns, so you don't have to adhere to the strict rules of adjectives. For example, color, diagnosis, the x-coordinate of a player in a game, speed, lives, lives remaining, street, size, weight, and name. As you can see, these are all attributes of classes, of specific classes, depending on the context. Remember that attributes are divided into two types. Class attributes, which are shared across instances of the class, and instance attributes, which are independent for each instance. So they can be updated and the other instances will not be affected. Finally, methods are commonly extracted from verbs. For example, move, display, register, sell, remove, calculate, find, concatenate, and reverse. These are examples of possible candidates for methods depending on the context. You will need to extract the verbs from the problem description. Always remember, classes are extracted from nouns, attributes from adjectives, and methods from verbs. You will have to analyze the problem description to identify these key elements for the design of the program. Great, so now that you know these guidelines, let's apply them to build the tic-tac-toe game. We will do this in the coming lectures. Before we start writing the actual code and planning the different classes that we're going to write, let's have a quick introduction to the tic-tac-toe game. This is the game that you're going to be building. This is a graphical representation. The tic-tac-toe game basically consists of a grid where each user can enter either a circle or an X depending on its designated marker. The grid has three rows and three columns, so we call it a 3x3 three three grid. The rows will be numbered from 1 to 3 in our game, 1, 2, and 3 from top to bottom, and the columns will be marked with a letter, A, B, and C, from left to right. So the final grid is going to look like this, where, for example, this element right here is at row 2 and column B. Or, for example, this element right here is at row 1 and column C. The player will have to enter a move, and that move is going to specify the row and the column where he or she would like to add the marker. The player wins when his or her marker fills the an entire row, an entire column, or an entire diagonal, either the main diagonal or the anti-diagonal from right to left, from left to right, or from right to left. Those are the different ways that a player can win the game. So now let's see some of the formal requirements that we gather from the game. You might have gotten these requirements from a client or from yourself as you analyze the problem and you identify what the game has to do. So let's read the first one. The game shall start by displaying a welcome message and an empty 3x3 three three board. This is to specify the dimensions of the board and it's telling us that we have to display a welcome message. So that is something that we have to take care of when we implement the code. There will be two players in the game, the user and the computer player. Based on this description, we already know that the user has to be a class. We could also call it a player because we're going to have a human player and a computer player right here. So we could implement just one class called player 
and make it act as either the human player or the computer player based on a condition. That is exactly what we are going to do. We have our first class. Let's assign a different color right here. Then we have that the user will have the X marker automatically. The user will not be able to choose the marker. He or she will have to use the X marker automatically. The computer player will therefore have the O marker, the circle, automatically. The user will be prompted to enter his or her move with the format row column. For example, the number of the row, row 1, and followed by the column, which is a letter, where row can be either 1, 2, or 3, from top to bottom, as you saw in the diagram, and where the column can be either A, B, or C, from left to right. These values shall be displayed on the board as a reference for the user to know which row is which and which column is which. If the user or the computer player selects a position that is already taken, a descriptive message should be displayed. Now, the updated board shall be displayed after entering or generating the move. After the user enters his or her move, the board with the update will be displayed. And after the computer player generates its move, the board will be displayed as well with this update. For a player to win the game, that is very important. How does a player win the game? Well, there must be a full row, a full column, or a full diagonal with its corresponding marker. The game ends when there is a tie, when the board is full and no one has won the game, or when the user or the computer player wins, when this criteria is met. The program shall assume that the user input will be in a correct format. This is to make the implementation of the code in this project, in this section, a little bit simpler, because we're not going to handle mistaken or wrong user input. We're going to assume that the user enters a valid format, a number followed by a letter. And this is basically the set of requirements that the game should meet. We're going to implement them in our code, and we are going to identify the different classes. We already know that we have to create a player class. And what other important class do we need to create? See if you can identify it in this description. What other key element do we have in the description? What other object do we have to incorporate into the classes that we're going to design? Well, it's right here in the first requirement, the board. The board is one of the key actors, one of the key objects in this description in the game. So we're going to create a board class and a player class. And the board and the player are going to have their own unique set of attributes and methods that we're going to extract from these requirements as we write the code. So now we know that we have to create two classes, the player class and the board class, because these are the two main actors in our game, the two main objects that we're going to represent. In the coming video, we're going to start implementing the player class. So I'll see you in the next video. This will be a quick preview of the project that we'll be building during this section. It's an interactive tic-tac-toe game. This is the main board of the game. A descriptive message welcoming the user is displayed and the player is prompted to enter a move. For example, let's say that we want to add an X, a marker, to this cell. Row 1, column A. We enter this move and we see an X displayed in the updated board. Then the computer moves automatically with a randomly generated move. And the O is added to the board at that particular position in the grid. Then we can move again, for example, to A. And the computer move randomly selected the row 2 and column B, but that space was already taken. And finally, we can enter 3A and we won the game, because A column was full with the X marker. This is how the game will work, and you will have this working game by the end of this section. We will build it piece by piece, so let's start working on it. Great, now you know how the game works and the requirements that we have to meet. So let's start writing the player class. We're going to start writing this class based on the requirements that you saw in the previous video. The player has to have a marker and the player has to be either human or a computer player. This marker will be either X or O depending on the type of user. If the user is a human user, then the marker will be X. And if the player is the computer player, then the marker is going to be an O, a circle. The marker, by default, will be X. So we're going to assign a default value for this attribute that we have right here. Then we have the second attribute for the player class is human. This attribute is a Boolean value, either true or false. 
It's true if the player is the human user. And it's false if the player is the computer player, the automated player that is going to select a random move. By default, the value of this attribute is going to be true. So by default, we are going to have a human user. And we're going to have to pass the value explicitly false for the computer user. Okay, so let's start writing the player class in a Python file, in our code. The first thing that we need to write is the keyword class, of course, and then we write the name of the class, which is player followed by a colon. We're going to define an init method, a constructor, to initialize these instance attributes. The attributes were marker and is human. The marker attribute, by default, had a value of x, the marker that we were going to assign to the human user by default. And the isHuman attribute is going to have a default value of true. Right here, the default value of isHuman is true. Within the body of the constructor of init, we define the instance attributes, marker, which we're going to make non-public to protect it from being accessed outside of the class, we're going to define a property for this attribute. And then we are going to define isHuman. And we assign this value right here. We save the file so we don't lose any work. You can save it with file save. Great, now we have our constructor. We have this parameter marker and is human. We assign those values to the corresponding instance attributes, marker and is human. By default, this has a value of x and this has the value true. Now let's define properties so we can access these attributes just with our names, without this underscore, and still the data is protected. This is a Pythonic way of defining getters and setters. We add the parameter self because we're writing a method. Remember that when we write methods, we have to add this parameter self as the first parameter, and we're going to return the value of the marker attribute. We write the name of the attribute that we defined right here, including the underscore. With this, we're going to be able to use the name of the property directly outside of the class. Then we're going to define another property, is human, for the other attribute. We're only going to allow access to these attributes, not changing the attributes, so we're not going to define setters for these properties. Right here, we return the value of the attribute is human, which is protected, and we create a new property. Now we can access the attributes marker and is human. Let's start diving into the methods. Right here you can see that we have three methods that were extracted from the description. Get player move, get human move, and get computer move. The get player move is the method that we're going to call. And this method is going to call either one of these two methods, either get human move or get computer move, based on whether the player is a human or a computer player. If the player is a human, this method will be called. And if it's a computer player, this method will be called. This method, the getHumanMove method, is going to take user input. It's going to prompt the user to enter the row and the column where he or she would like to add the marker. And this method right here, getComputerMove, is going to select a random space to make the move, a random row and a random column to add the marker. Let me add some space right here so we can add the methods in the class. We're still working on the player class. And now we are going to define three methods. We're going to start writing their definitions first, and then we're going to fill in their bodies. You will see in just a moment why. We have the getPlayerMove method, which is going to be the main method that we're going to call to get the move from a player, either the human player or the computer player. Right here in the body, we're going to temporarily add this statement right here, the pass statement. This is used when we want to fill in something that has to be completed later, but we have to fill in the body. For example, right here, we can leave the body of the method empty until we go back to it. So we just write the pass statement and then delete it. Then we're going to define the getHumanMove method. This is going to get the move from the human user. We write pass and then the computer move method right here. We already know what these methods should do. This method asks for user input, for the user to enter the row and the column of the move, and this method generates a computer move automatically. It selects a row and a column randomly. 
These two methods are called by the main method, but this method, get player move. This is the method that we're going to call from outside of the class, and these two methods are going to be like internal to the class. So let's start writing the body of this method right here. What do we want to do? First, we want to check if the player is either a human player or a computer player. And how can we do that? Well, we can use, we can check the value of the is human attribute. In this case, we are going to add the underscore because we're using the internal property of the class. You could also use the name of the property, but this is commonly used outside of the class. So self is human. If the player is human, then we want to call the get human move method. Else, if the player is not human, so it's the computer player, then we want to call the get computer move method. So this is basically the implementation of get player move. It helps us choose which method we have to call, if human move or computer move. So let's implement these two methods. The get human move asks for user input using the input function. It prompts the user to enter the move. You can customize this, but I will write this message right here. Player move followed by a colon and a space after the colon because the prompt will be right here. So we give it some space or a separation from the colon right here. It's best for presentation purposes when we write these messages in the input function. Then we're going to store that input as a string in this variable move and we are going to return it. That's it. That's the implementation of the get human move method. And now we have to go to the get computer move method. This one is a little bit more elaborate because we have to generate the row and the column randomly. Let's start by generating the row. And how can we select something randomly from a sequence of valid values? Well, we use the import statement to import the random module. We go to the very top of the file, we click enter and we add a few lines right here. And at the top of the file, we write import random. This will import helpful functions that we can use to generate random numbers. In this case, we're just going to use one function, which is going to let us choose an element from a sequence randomly. We write random, which is the name of the module, dot choice. This is the name of the function that selects an element randomly from a sequence and we write the sequence. But what sequence do we have to write right here? Well, the sequence of valid rows, one, two, and three. Those are the valid identifiers for a row, as you saw in the previous diagram of the three by three grid. And the column will also be selected randomly. So we have choice, and now we have to choose between A, B, or C to select either the first column, the second column, or the third column. Now that we have the random choice of row and column, we can display the computer move because the human user has to know the latest move in the board. So we write computer move, which is O. We're going to remind the user the marker of the computer player, followed by a colon and a space, and we just print the row and the column. Okay, so we convert the row to a string to print it because this is an integer, we're going to convert it to a string and we also write the column right here. But instead of adding a comma, which is going to add a space between the row and the column, we're going to concatenate them. So the column is immediately after the row without a space separating it. So we're going to have something like this, 1a, without a space in the middle. This is a format that we ask the user to enter the move, so we have to keep that format for the computer move. Then we simply return the string row plus column. Since we are using this expression in two different places in the function, we could perhaps store this string in a variable called move and display the move directly and return it. This is an alternative to avoid repeating this expression right here. We store it in the variable and we use the variable directly in the print statement and in the return statement. Great, so now we've implemented the methods of the player class and we completed the code for the player class. We have two attributes, marker and isHuman, that we have right here. 
and we define them as properties. Then we define the method getPlayerMove, which selects which method to call if they get human move or the get computer move method based on whether the player is human or not, if it's the computer player or the human player. The get human move method takes the user input and it returns it in the appropriate format. Remember that right here we are assuming that the format of the user input is going to be correct, a numbered followed by a letter. And the get computer move method selects a random row, a random column, makes a move from that combination. It prints or displays a selected move and it returns the move as a string. Now the player class is complete. So let's start writing the board class, which is another key class for the implementation of the tic-tac-toe game. We will start implementing it in the next video. Great, now we've made the player class from the requirements that we gathered for this project. So now let's start analyzing and writing the board class. The board is another main element of the game. So we're going to represent it with a class and all the main functionality of the board will be represented as methods. The key attribute of the board class is going to be the game board attribute. This attribute right here, which is going to keep or store a list that represents the board of the game, the three by three grid with three rows and three columns. And how are we going to represent that exactly? Well, with a 2D list, a two dimensional list in Python, which looks like this. It's basically a list that contains lists as elements. You can see them separated with a comma right here. So each list is an individual element of the outer list that surrounds all the different internal lists. It's a list of lists. These internal lists will make the rows of the tic-tac-toe game and the individual elements at the same index in different lists are going to be the columns. As you can see, this would be index zero of each one of the lists. This would be index one and this would be index two. All the elements at the same index are going to be considered part of the same column. This is the basic structure of the board. And the class is going to have three more attributes, which are going to be constants. These constants will be empty, columns, and rows. And they will be written in capital letters, in, in uppercase letters, because this is a convention in Python. When something is a constant and its value should not change, we write the name in uppercase letters and underscores if we need to. The empty constant is going to store the symbol that we are going to use to denote an empty cell. For example, in this 2D list, when we find a zero in a specific cell, in a specific location of a list, then that means that that cell is empty. We need to have some way to represent that. If neither the user or nor the computer player have chosen that specific location in the board. That is what the empty constant is for. The columns constant is going to map each one of the columns to its corresponding index grid. And the rows constant is going to be a list of the valid rows for the board. One, two, and three. Let's take a closer look at this columns constant and what it's going to represent. Right here we have the 2D grid that is going to represent the board. The first column is A, the second column is B, and the third column is C. This is the notation that we use to represent the columns when we display the board to the user. But those columns have to be mapped to the corresponding indices that they represent. A is index 0 because all the elements at index 0 are part of the first column of column A. Index 1 corresponds to all the elements of the column B. And index 2 corresponds to all the elements of the column C, of the third column in the board. So that is basically what we're going to have. We're going to have a dictionary that maps the letter A to the index 0, the letter B to the value 1, and the letter C to the value 2. The rows constant is going to be a list with the valid rows, 1, 2, and 3. Then we're going to convert them to the corresponding values as indices. Let's start implementing the board class in the code. In the same file where you've been working, where you wrote the player class, let's go right here below. And below the player class, we are going to start defining the board class with the class keyword, and we define this right here with a colon. 
The first thing that we're going to define in this case is going to be the constants. Empty is the first constant that we're going to add. We're going to write it in uppercase letters because this is a convention in Python. When we have a constant, we write the name in uppercase letters and underscores if necessary to separate different words. We're going to assign the value zero to this constant. Why? Because we're going to use zero as the symbol to denote an empty cell in the board. Then we are going to define this constant, columns. This is going to be a dictionary that is going to map the name of each one of the columns, A, B, and C, that we're using to display the board to the user, to its corresponding index in the list. 0, 1, and 2. And then we have the rows constant, which is going to be 1, 2, and 3. We can define this as a list or we can define this as a tuple if we want to take advantage of the immutability of this data structure that it cannot be changed or modified. So we are protecting the data much better right here. Now that we have our constants defined in the class, we can start writing the constructor, the init method. With the dev keyword and double underscored, we write init. And of course, self is always the first parameter and this was something that I decided to implement for this constructor. Well, we are going to add a parameter, gameborn, which a default value of none. And why are we going to do this? Because perhaps the user or the developer in the future is going to want to start the game with a specific board, an initial board instead of the default board. So we're going to give that option from the start. We're going to think about the future and some future needs that the game or developers might have. In this case, we are going to give the option to customize the initial board. We're going to say, if the game board is not none, then we are going to assign that board as the game board. Else, if the game board, if this parameter was none, then we are going to use the default board that we are going to define right here. We start, how do we define this? We start by defining a list, a regular list that you commonly use in Python. And then inside that list, we are going to add three lists as the elements. This is a list, this is a list, and this is a list. Right now they're empty, but we are going to structure them in such a way that we're going to have a three by three grid. For visibility purposes, you can write the list like this and you will see how the grid starts to look like a grid. Right here. We are going to start with zeros because that is the value for the empty cell. We could start with zeros or we can use this constant right here. We're starting with zeros because that is the, the symbol that we are defining as the symbol to the note an empty cell. We're going to use this constant in our code to check if an SL is empty in this board. This is the default board that we're going to use to start the game. Remember to separate the lists with commas. That is why it's very helpful to start defining it as we did. First the list and then populating the list with the elements. Great, we have the board class with the constants and with the constructor, the init method. So let's start analyzing what the board class needs to do, the methods that we have to implement. Let's save the file and start analyzing the methods. The first method that we're going to implement is called print board, and we're going to use it to display the board as we update it with the player's move. This is the first method that we're going to write, and you're going to start writing it in the next video because it is quite detailed and we have a specific format that we want to get to display the board to the user. Then in the coming videos, we're going to start implementing these two methods, submit move and is move valid. The submit move method is going to take the player's move and it's going to update the board so that it adds the marker either X or O to the board, to the two dimensional list that represents the board. And this method is move valid is going to return true if the player's move was valid or false if it wasn't valid if it was out of the range of valid rows or columns. Remember that we said that we're not going to check if the format of the user input is correct. We're not going to check that because we're assuming that the user entered a number followed by a letter. 
but that number and that letter might not be valid. So we're going to check that in this method, is move valid. And finally, we are going to implement this method, is winner. This is perhaps the most detailed method of the entire game because this is going to determine if the human player or the computer player have, has won the game after each move. And how is it going to do that? Well, it's going to check the current row of the move to check if the row has three equal symbols for the player that made the move. If the row is full with the same elements, then that means that the player won the game. Then it's going to check the row of the current move. For example, if the current move was adding this X right here to the board, then this current row is going to be checked and this column is going to be checked to see if the player has won the game. And we are also going to check the diagonal of the board if it's full with the same marker, if the player has won with this diagonal or with the anti-diagonal, which is also a scenario where the player could win the game if the anti-diagonal is full with the same marker as well. We're going to write these methods in a sequence of videos because they are more detailed. In the next video, we're going to print the board, so I'll see you there. Now we're in the board class and we're going to start implementing the print board method. So let's define it right here, print board. Let's move a little bit down right here so you can see it better. And we add self as the parameter for the method. The question right now is, how do we want to print the board? Well, the final output should look like this. When the game just starts and displays a descriptive message, and right here we have the board, the current state of the board when all the cells are empty. We immediately see, as part of the board, the first row. The first row has the letters as a visual reference for the user, A, B, and C. We're going to have to print this row with the corresponding spaces to make it look nice. So let's start doing that. The first line that we'd write is print A, B, and C. But we have to add the necessary spaces to make everything fit correctly. Before the A, we're going to add one, two, three, and four spaces. And between A and B, we're going to have three spaces. And between B and C, we're going to have three spaces. One, two, and three. Perfect one, two, and three. This is how we're going to align the letters to the different columns in the board that is displayed. After this first row, you can see that we have a pattern that repeats itself. We have three rows in which the number of the row is printed and the elements of the row are displayed separated with a vertical bar. And after those rows, we have a line with a sequence of horizontal lines. We're going to focus on these rows right now. And how can we print them using a for loop? Well, let's see. After this print statement, we are going to write a for loop that is going to use a very nice tool that Python gives us. We're going to use enumerate. We say for i and row in enumerate, this is a function that is going to return a counter the value of the variable i is going to be a counter that is going to be incremented by 1 for each iteration. It's going to start at 1, and then it will be incremented to 2, and then to 3. And this variable is going to have the value of the row of the board. We want to do that with the game board. And we want the count to start from 1. That is the second parameter that we pass to enumerate. Because the sequence right here starts from 1, 1, 2, and 3. And then for each element of the game board, we want to assign right here the row. For each row, what do we want to do? First, we want to print the number. So that number is the value of the variable i. This number has to be followed by a vertical bar and by the value of the row in the current state of the board. We can do that with the end parameter of the print statement. Instead of making a new line after printing one, we are going to end the, this print statement with a vertical bar, a space, a vertical bar, and then another space. That will give us the separation that you can see right here between the number and the vertical bar, and then the center of this cell, where the value will appear if there is an X or a no. After this, we want to print each value of the row. We want to take the current state of the board right here and we want to print each cell in the board, whether it's an X, an O, or a zero. If it's an empty cell, we don't display anything. 
So we can do that with a for loop. For each column in the row, we have nested loops right here. For each column in it, the row, if the column is not equal to the symbol that we assigned as empty, as an empty cell, if the current value is not the marker for an empty cell, if the cell is not empty, then we print the value at the column, followed by a space, a vertical bar, and another space. That will occur if the cell is not empty, if the player or the computer have set the marker at that cell specifically. Else, if the cell is empty, then we just want to print an empty space. And we can do that right here. With a space, a vertical bar, and another space, followed by an empty string. So we don't want to print a new line, we want to continue printing on the same line, but we just want to print an empty space, a vertical bar, and another empty space. That will give us the presentation that you can see right here. If there is an X, it will be displayed right here. There will be a space before the X and a space after the X, and the X will be in the middle. The same will occur if there is a circle. And if the cell is empty, only an empty space will be displayed. What we just wrote will get us this pattern. Three rows with the numbers one, two, and three, followed by a space, and then this sequence of elements. If there is an element, it will be displayed if there is a value. And if the cell is empty, an empty cell will be displayed, followed by a vertical bar. And we get this structure in the board. Then we see this right here. We have to print a line with dashes to make the separation of the different rows. Let's do that. This is the inner nested loop that is going to print the elements of the row. After that loop has been completed, at the same level of indentation as the for keyword, we want to write this right here. A new line, because we want this series of dashes to appear in a new line. And we write the sequence of dashes. This will be approximately trial and error how many dashes you have to write. But in my case, I used approximately 15 dashes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 dashes. And that will result in this separation that you can see between the rows. Great, so now we have the print board method implemented. Let's check it out in the interactive shell to see how the board is currently printed. We can test this with the board that is generated by default that will be empty. And we should see the board as output, this part of the board. We will just see this board right here. Let's run the code and create an instance of a board. You can test your code like this as you write the methods. You just create an instance of board with an empty list of parameters to use the default value for the board, and then you call the print board method, like this. And you can see the board right here, but you can see that they are not really aligned right now, and that is because there is a missing space in this definition right here. We need to add a second space before the vertical bar in the else clause. If we run the code again, you can see that now they are aligned correctly. You need to add two spaces before the vertical bar within the loop. Great work. We have the print board method implemented. In the next video, we're going to implement the method submit move, and we're going to check if the move is valid. See you in the next video. Now that we have the print board method of the board class, let's start writing the submit move and the is move valid methods. Below the print board method, we start by defining the submit move method. This method is going to take two parameters. Of course, additional to self, which is always the first parameter in the list of a method. The second parameter is going to be move, which is going to be the string that defines the move of the player for the current iteration of the game. The move is going to be, for example, 1a. It's going to be a string with a number that represents the row and a letter that represents the column. We write this and let's temporarily write pass right here to fill the body of the method. Let's also define the method is move valid. 
This method is going to take an additional parameter, which is the move. It's going to check if the move was valid or not, if the row and the column is in a valid range. So let's check this with this method. It's going to return true if the move is valid and false if the move is not valid. We say return. And since the condition is going to test three conditions, three aspects of the move, we are going to divide it, we're going to write it in several lines, and we can do that with parentheses in Python. We're going to check if the length of the string is 2, because there can only be two characters in the string. If the length is 2 and the first element, the row, is in the valid range of rows, This is the row, the first character of the string, converted to an integer if that row is in the valid list of rows, the class attribute that we defined right here with the valid list of rows. And if the column is valid, this selects the letter from the move. Move of 0 is the first element in the string, the number, and move of 1 at index 1 is the letter. If the letter is in the valid list of columns. This is going to check if the letter is in the dictionary as a key. If all of these conditions are true, let's close the parentheses right here. We have a multi-line condition. If all of these conditions are true, then true will be returned and the move is valid, else false will be returned. Let's review the structure of this method quickly. We're checking if the move has a length of two. If it has two characters. Then we're checking if the row is valid within the valid range of rows and then we are checking if the column is valid either A, B or C. So we can start writing the submit move method which is going to use this method that we have right here. What do we need to check first to submit a move in the game? Well first we have to check if that move is valid right? So let's do that. Let's check this first. If the move is not valid, and how do we know if the move is valid? Well, by calling this method, is move valid. This is going to return true if the move is valid and false otherwise. So if the move is not valid, then we are just going to print a descriptive message. Invalid input. Please enter the row and column of your move. Example 1a. Right here, we have the print statement invalid input. Please enter the row and column of your move. And within parentheses, we write an example of the format that we are expecting the number followed by a letter. After that, we are going to return. We're going to write a return statement because we want to end the function. We print this message and we end the function because the move could not be submitted. The board is not updated or modified in any way. Else, if the move was valid, then we do have to update the board. And how do we do that? First, we need to find the row and the column in the 2D list. And for that, we can get the row index again. We get the number, we convert it to an integer, and we subtract 1 to get the corresponding row index. And then, to get the index of the column, we need to find the matching number for the column. Right here, we get the value that corresponds to the letter of the move in the columns dictionary, which is a class attribute. This dictionary that we have right here that maps each column to its corresponding value or index in the list. After we have these two values, then we can check the value that is currently at that index. To check if the space was already taken, because the user could perhaps enter a move or a location that was already taken with an X or a circle. So we need to check that. To get the current value at this particular position in the board, we just retrieve that element from the two-dimensional list with the row index and then the column index. This accesses the row first, the list, and then the corresponding element in the list, the column. That value, we're going to store it in a variable called value. 
to make the code more readable because we're going to use it in this conditional. We're going to check if the value is the, the symbol that we assigned to an empty cell, then that means that the cell is empty and we can update the value appropriately in the two dimensional list that represents the board. So let's do that. Self dot game board and we need to specify the row that we want to modify and the column that we want to modify. And what are we going to assign at that position of the list? Well, we are going to assign the marker of the player. That is why the method takes the player in addition to the move, because we need to know which marker we're going to assign at that particular location. Now this handles the case when the position was empty, but if the position was already taken, then we have to print a descriptive message. This space is already taken. Let's review this method quickly. This is the submit move method. It takes the move that we want to submit to the board and the player that is submitting the move. If the move is not valid, then a descriptive message is displayed and the function is completed without affecting the board. Else, if the move was valid, then we get the corresponding row and column. We check if the position was available by checking the value that is currently at that position in the board. And if the value represents an empty cell, we assign the marker of the player at that particular position in the board. Else, if the position was already taken, we print a descriptive message. Now we have the submit move method and the is move valid method implemented. In the next video, we're going to implement the logic to determine if a player, either the human or the computer player, won the game by checking the rows, columns, and diagonals. So I'll see you in the next video. Now we have the submit move method and the is move valid methods implemented in our board class. Now we have to implement the logic that will determine if the player, the human or the computer player, wins the game. Let's do that with the isWinner method, which is going to return true if the player is the winner of the game and the game should stop. This method is going to take three additional parameters, besides self, of course. The player, that could be the potential winner, the row, and the column. For this method, we are going to assume the row and the column as a string, the number as a string and the column as a string, okay? So let's implement this method. What do we need to do to check if a player is the winner of the game? Well, we have to check each row, each column, the diagonal, the main diagonal from left to right, and the anti-diagonal from right to left. Those are the possible scenarios for a player to win the game. We only need to check the row and column of the latest move because that is the only possibility that the player will win if the column or the row has been completed with the latest move. We're going to need smaller methods that are going to perform these tasks, checking the row, the column, and the diagonals. So the first method is going to be check row. The first argument is self, and then, of course, the method has to know which row is going to be checked and the player that we're going to check we're going to check if the player has enough markers in the row to fill the row. That is the first method. Then we are going to check the column. This method checks the column that could make the player the winner of the game, and it takes the player. And then we will have two additional methods. Check diagonal, which only takes the player, and check anti-diagonal. which takes the player as well. Okay, so we have these five methods that are going to help us check if the player that made the latest move is the winner of the game. Let's implement the isWinner method before we implement these helper methods. If the current row is full with the player's markers, then that means that the player won, so we return true. Else if the column is full with the player's markers, then we return true. Else, else if the diagonal is full with the player's markers, then we also have to return true because the player won. And the same occurs with the anti-diagonal. 
Else, if neither one of these cases are true, if the row is not full with the markers, if the column is not full, if the diagonal is not full, and if the anti-diagonal is not full, then the player did not win the game in this particular round. So, we have to return false. That is the main logic of the isWinner method. We check the row, the column, the diagonal, and the anti-diagonal, and return true if either one of these cases makes the player win the game. Else, false is returned. We could make this more compact by writing a single condition with all of these conditions and using the OR operator. You can refactor this with a single condition in an IF statement. So now let's implement the check row, check column, check diagonal, and check anti-diagonal methods. For the check row method, we need to check all the elements in the row. Let's visualize this. Here we have a board. Let's say that this is the current state of the board at a particular point of the game. We can identify X markers and circles, O markers. Let's say that the last movement made by the user was this one right here, row 1, column A. What the check row method is going to do is going to be checking this list right here, the first nested list at index 0. And it's going to check the individual elements of that list to verify if the number of X's, the number of markers of the player that made the last move is equal to 3, to check if the row is full with the markers of the player. In this case, that is not true because right here we have an empty cell. If we had an X right here, then the check row method would return true because the row is full and the player won. Let's implement this in our code. The first thing that we need to do is to get the row index. Remember that we are assuming that the row and the column are passed as strings to the method. So we need to convert that into an integer like this. Then after we have the, the index that corresponds to the row, we need to get the actual value of the row. We need to have this list right here to check its individual elements. And that is what we are going to do. We get the row from the board. And since the game board is a list that contains lists, we are going to access the row index. This is going to return the current row, so we can check its individual values. Then we are going to use a special function, a particular function that we can use in Python, which is going to count how many elements match the element that we describe. Board row is a list. And we are going to count how many times a particular element occurs in that list. We are going to count how many times the marker of the player appears in the list. If the number of markers of the player in the row is equal to 3, then that row is full with the player's markers. And true is returned by the method. Else, false will be returned from the method right here. It always returns a boolean value. Now we have the check row method implemented. We can check if a row determines the winner of this game. But that may not be the case. The player might still win if the column is full with its markers. So we are going to implement this method now. First, let's take a look at the logic right here. This entire column right here is made by the elements located at index 0 of each one of the lists. This is a list. This is another list. And this is another list, and these elements are located at index 0. Then, these elements are located at index 1, and these elements are at index 2. The elements of the same column have the same index in their corresponding list. That's what we're going to use to implement this method. First of all, we need to transform the column that we get as a string, right here, into an index that we can use to access the two-dimensional list. We use the columns dictionary from the board class, this dictionary that we have right here, that maps the names of the columns to the corresponding indices. And then we want to keep track of the total number of markers that we found for the player. We're going to use a for loop to get each one of the rows, and then we are going to select the element at a particular index, and that will give us all the elements of the same column. 
That is basically the logic that we're going to use. We're going to use a for loop to get each one of the rows, and then we're going to use an index to access all the elements of the same column. Let's implement this in their code. For i in range of three, because we have three rows, if the element at that particular position, which is the row i, and the column that we had right here, the column that we're currently checking, if that element matches the marker of the player, then we are going to increment the number of total markers by one. That is going to count how many markers of the current player are in the same column. After the loop has been completed and we know the total number of markers, then we are going to check if the total number of markers is three. And if that is true, then that means that the column is full with the same markers that match the player markers. In that case, the user has won the game, the computer or human user. Else, the user has not won the game and we return false. That is basically the implementation of check column. We take the column as the argument, the player, and then we get the column index and we count the total number of markers in the column. We check if that total number is three. In that case, the player has won, so we return true, else we return false. Okay, so we can check now rows and columns. What happens with the diagonals? Well, it's very similar with a little change in the indices. Let's see the logic. For the main diagonal, we have this right here. The main diagonal moves from left to right, and it is made from the element at this position, this position, and this position right here. And what is so curious about these elements in particular in terms of their indices? Well, they have the same value for the indices. This element is at index 0, 0, the first list and the first element in the list. Then this element is at index 1, 1. It is in the list 1 and it is the second element of the list, so it's 1, 1. And this one is at index 2, 2 because this is the third list, index two, and it is the third element in the list. So we can use a double index of two, two. As you can see, the values are equal, so we can use this in our code to check the diagonal. In this case, we don't need any specific rows or columns. We're only going to check the three elements in the diagonal. We're going to keep track of the total number of markers that we found so far, and we're going to use a loop to access the elements of the diagonal. For i in range of three, because we have three rows, if the element at position i, i, so for the first row, that would be zero, zero, for the second row, one, one, and for the third row, two, two, as you saw in the diagram, if that element is equal to the marker of the current player, then we increase the counter by one. And finally, we check if the total number of markers is equal to 3. If that is the case, then we return true, because the player has 1. The diagonal is full with the markers of the player, else we return false. Great! Now we have the check diagonal method implemented in our code, and we only have one method left to implement, the check anti-diagonal. The anti-diagonal is this diagonal that you can see right here this one right here, this one right here, and this one right here. That is exactly what we are going to do with a loop, but now we need a different condition, because notice the different combination of indices. We have two with zero, we have one with one, and we have zero with two right here. That would be zero, two, one, one, and two, zero. This method takes the player because we have to check the marker. We're going to keep track of the total number of markers. And then using a for loop, we are going to iterate over all the rows. And we are going to check if the element at a particular position matches the marker of the player. Like this. But what do we need to write right here? This is not the case where the indices are equal. With the diagonal, this was quite easy, quite intuitive. 
The value of the column was equal to the value of the row, but now that is not the case. We need to find an expression that works for this situation. We need something that matches this pattern. Let me write this with a comment so we can illustrate this. When the row is 0, the column has to be 2. When the row is 1, the column has to be 1. And when the row is 2, the column has to be 0. Okay? And how do we do that? How do we get that pattern? Well, we can do that with this expression. If we use i for the row, because we're incrementing it using range, we get 0, 1, and 2, exactly what we need. That is the sequence returned by range. But for the column, we need to use the value of i to get this sequence, 2, 1, and 0. And how can we do that? With 2 minus i. Let's see how this works. Let me write this right here. When i is 0, when i is 1, and when i is 2. Those are the values that i is going to take, and i is representing the row. 2 minus i takes the value 2. 2 minus 1 is 1, and 2 minus 2 is 0. Exactly what we needed. i is taking the role of the row, row index, and 2 minus i is taking the role of the column index right here. And we get exactly what we need. So we can match and check the elements in the anti-diagonal. If we find the match, we increment the counter for the total number of markers and total markers. If that is equal to 3, then we return true. Great work! Now we have all the main methods of the board class. See you in the next video where we will implement the functionality of the game. Now we're in the final phase of the project. We implemented the two classes that we need for the game, the player and the board classes, and we are ready to start writing the main logic and functionality of the game. The first thing that we were asked to implement in the main game was a descriptive welcome message to welcome the user to the game. So let's do that. We are going to write a sequence of asterisks and the name tic-tac-toe in the middle. After testing the number of asterisks, I think that 16 asterisks look pretty well to cover the entire word. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Then, in the middle, we want to write a descriptive message. You can customize this. For example, tic-tac-toe with an exclamation mark. And then we can copy-paste this sequence of asterisks again. If we want to check how this looks in the interactive shell, we can run the code and see that the name is indeed covered by this sequence of asterisks. Let's remove, let's say, two asterisks and see if this looks even better. I think it does. We could add a space before the word tic-tac-toe. Great! So now we have a descriptive message for the user. After printing a, the descriptive message, we have to create the relevant instances for our game. We have the classes, but we don't have the instances that we can work with in the game. So that is our main priority right now. We're going to create an instance of born, so we can play the game with this born. And we're going to create an instance of player for the human player. And we're also going to create another instance of player for the computer player. In this case, we are going to pass two values, two arguments. The marker, which is O and the value false, because remember that by default this marker was x and this was true, to define a human player. In this case, we want to define a computer player, so we have to specify these two values. We can review this by going to the player class and going to the constructor. We can see that we have to pass the marker and false for human if we want to define a computer player. Okay. Now we have the relevant instances for the game, the board, the player, and the computer player. So the first thing that we have to do after printing the descriptive message is displaying the board, of course, to give the user an idea of the board that he or she will be playing with. Then this is where the logic of the game starts, really, because the program only stops when, the player, when a player wins and when there is a tie. So we are going to use a while true loop, which is going to keep looping until a condition is met and we break out of the loop. The repetitive process has to be getting the player's move. 
we have to ask the user to enter his or her move. So we are going to call the get player move method on the player instance. We want to get the player's move. This is the human player. And then after we get that move, we want to submit the move to the board. We want to process that move and determine if it's valid or not and update the board accordingly. So that is what we are doing right here. Let me add the script of comments to see what we are doing. Ask human user move. Then we are going to submit the move to the board. Then we are going to print the board because we want to see the updated version of the board. If the move wasn't valid, then the same board will be printed, but we have to show the user that the board was not updated. Then after we have the move and we updated the board, we want to check if the player has won. But before we do that, we need to check if the move was valid. We call the isMoveValid method and we pass the user's move. We check if the move was valid and if it was valid, we check if the player is the winner. We pass the player, we pass the row, and we pass the column. Remember that move is represented as a string with the row as the first character and the column as the second character. If that is the case, if the move was valid, and the player was the winner, then we print, you win. You can make this message more descriptive and customize it to your liking. In that case, we break out of the loop. We stop this while true loop. We stop this infinite loop and the game ends. Else, if that doesn't happen, if the move was not valid or if the player was not the winner in this round of the game, then we want to get the computer move. We call get player move from the computer instance. Let me add this descriptive comment. Ask computer player move. And then we are going to submit that move again. Board dot submit move. We pass the computer move and we pass the user, the player that is making the move. In this case, it is the computer making the move. Then we want to print the board. So we call print board on the board instance. After the computer has made the move, we want to repeat this logic and check if the computer has won the game. But this time there is actually no need to check if the move was valid because we are generating a random move from the set of valid columns and rows. We only need to check if the computer was the winner. And pass the latest move of this player. Right here we pass the row and right here we pass the column. If that is the case, then we print the computer one. We can write it with capitalized right here. And if that is the case, if the computer won, then we break out of the loop, we stop the process and the game ends. This is the basic logic of the game. It is a repetitive process. We ask the user to enter the move, we submit the move and update the board accordingly, then we print the board, we check if the move was valid and if the player was the winner in this round. If that is the case, a descriptive message is displayed and the process stops. Else we ask for the computer player to make a move. Then we submit the move to the board and we print the board with the updates. We check if the computer player was the winner this time. And if that was the case, then we print a descriptive message and stop the game. Else the process continues until one of the players is the winner or until there is a time. This part right here is not repetitive, but it is key for the process. We are creating the three instances that we use in our game. The board instance, the human player instance, and the computer player instance. And we print the board initially after printing a descriptive message. Great work. So now we can run the game and see how it works. And voila, here we have our game. We see a descriptive message welcoming the user to the game. Tic-tac-toe, we see an initial empty board with the rows and the columns. And we see a prompt to enter the player move. 
Let's say that we want to add an X to the cell 1A. We write 1A and we immediately see the updated board with the X on row 1 and column A and we see the computer move which was generated automatically. The computer added an O to the cell 2A. Now we are prompted to enter another move, for example 1B. The computer added a no to the cell 3A, so in this case we're going to win because we are going to enter 1C. Like this. So a row has been filled with the player's marker and the game ends because the player has won the match. Awesome, right? Now we have a working tic-tac-toe game implemented with the principles of object-oriented programming. I really hope you liked this project and that you found it helpful to understand how object-oriented analysis and design works behind the scenes, how we take a problem description and build a working product from it based on the classes that we identify and the methods and attributes of the classes.